meeting is adjourned. I'm now gathering us into our regular meeting number 33. It will now come to order. May I have a, uh, uh, will now come to order. May we have the playing of the national anthem. Would you please lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. This afternoon, Council is pleased to have uh, Pastor Vincent Gold, the senior pastor of Unity Baptist Church, who will lead us in prayer. Pastor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Council President. Let us pray. Our great God and Father, we are grateful for this time to share. Lord, we thank you for our great city of Columbus. We ask your blessings upon the city, our mayor, Mayor Ginther, our Council President Harden, Council members and staff. Lord, we pray as that business is discussed tonight that you would give understanding, wisdom, and knowledge that things be done decent and in order. Even as this great city leaders look to ways to help this city during this COVID, during these unprecedented times, give them understanding. Help them to navigate us through this process. The Lord will be better. We thank you now. Keep us in your perfect peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Thank you for being with us uh, this Bless evening. Bless Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting. Pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12, any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can I get a motion dismissed with the reading of the journal? So moved. And I heard a second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications? Not this time. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the mayor reached out and uh, asked if he could come to council. And uh, as this used to be his old stomping grounds, we uh, Wanted to welcome him back, uh, I think, to uh, talk about uh, uh, and frame kind of a conversation that we will have as a community going forward over the next couple of months, and that is uh, the state of our, our budget and, and how we move forward together. With that, I invite uh, our, our mayor, Andy Gimber. Well, good evening, Mr. President, and to all of the council members, thanks for allowing me to join you for a few minutes tonight, uh, all the members of the cabinet, uh, Auditor Kilgore, City Attorney Klein. You know, when COVID-19 showed its ugly face in Columbus back in March, we knew we faced three crises, a health crisis, human service crisis, and an economic crisis. Together, we've made some enormous sacrifices as a community to slow the spread of the virus and have seen 
some progress as of late because of the great leadership and guidance of Dr. Mashika Roberts, but also our community's commitment, the way folks have stepped up, uh, you know, by complying with facial coverings and, and masks, prohibiting the sale of alcohol at restaurants and bars after 10 p.m. and pushing for testing and contact tracing, the likes of which we've never seen through Columbus Public Health. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you for your support of that work. We've also invested significant funds to ease the burden on our residents uh, who have been disproportionately negatively impacted by these crises. A million dollars for the Community Shelter Board, half a million dollars for the YMCA, $400,000 for Life Care Alliance for senior meals, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Urban League for technology assistance for small businesses. And now we're facing the economic side of the crisis from the city. Because our revenue is so closely tied to income tax, the staggering unemployment rate has drastically reduced our revenue. And on June 9th, the Auditor Kilgore officially reduced our resources for the general fund by $41.5 million. Tonight, we're putting forth an ordinance to reduce the general fund budget by $41.5 million. Because of solid fiscal management led by Finance Director Joe Lombardi and all of our cabinet in partnership with council we've been able to save 40 million dollars by eliminating travel delaying merit raises and imposing a hiring freeze on almost all positions the additional shortfall will be made up from the basic city services fund that currently has a balance of 20.8 million dollars <laughs> colleagues these are very trying times and as our residents and employers struggle will have to continue to find ways to manage spending, but I'm committed to assuring that core city services remain intact. I, do, I wanna offer some perspective, and I have to give credit where credit is due to Auditor Kilgore. She shared this with me just about a month or so ago. We started collecting income tax in 1948. We were second in the country to Toledo, actually, to start doing that. Since then, we've had only five negative years, meaning a negative drop year over year, just five since 1948. The worst of those years back in 2009, the second half of the double dip recession was only 0.85%, less than 1%. Today, we're forecasting a drop of 4.7%, five times worse than our previous worst year. And we're not, by any stretch, the worst off in the country, nor even the state. But again, to balance our needs on real life context for Columbus, this is five times worse than the Great Recession. Some sobering facts and figures from our auditor. I know that we're currently working on an operating fund budget for 2021, which will be less than the 2020 approved budget by city council as well as a capital budget that will be far less than anticipated at the beginning of the year. By charter, we will produce a budget that is balanced, which will also help us stay financially strong. Together, we'll work to fund those programs that are most important to the economic recovery and stability of our great city. Mr. President, thank you for allowing me to join you for a few minutes tonight and share some of those comments as we contemplate finalizing our proposed budget in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And like, like we've said uh, before, uh, in, in private conversations, council uh, is a partner uh, as we uh, really move through these um, unparalleled times. Uh, but, but look forward to council to be a partner with you uh, as we continue to, to move our city forward. I also wanted to give uh, our Madam Auditor a chance to speak on this as well. I know that we'll probably have a little bit more discussion as uh, Finance Chair Brown brings uh, forward that legislation, but I wanted, before we even got there, to have uh, our auditor uh, provide some remarks. Thank you, Council President Hardin, members of Council, Mayor. Um, I would just simply add uh, to the Mayor's summary that right now, you know, the difficulty in predicting how even the next few months are going to go really hinges on things that are outside of our control. Um, you know, if there were to be, uh, right now, um, given where we are with revenues today, I'm comfortable that we're still within the, the limits 
of the revised revenue estimate, which was a decrease of 4.7% over those 2019 actuals. Where it gets very concerning is that if there were an outbreak or a, you know something that would impact our ability to keep our, our economy, quote unquote, open, that could very quickly and drastically alter the revenues for the city of Columbus. And so that's what the finance director and I spend a lot of time looking at right now. And very simply, that's going to be success of public health, things like duration, how long um, this lasts, and then also some new variables in the world of economic modeling, which includes things like fear, um, employee fear, employer fear, as well as consumer sentiment. So uh, we're navigating a lot, um, but very soon we'll be looking to 21 and sharing those ideas uh, as we see projections unfolding with you. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Madam Auditor. And again, thank you, Mayor, for, for joining us and bringing that conversation. We look forward to working with both and uh, working with my, my colleagues and the Chair of Finance as we uh, move through the rest of the year and through the budget process. Um, as I've taken to at the beginning of each council mem uh, meeting, reminding folks that we are still uh, battling uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, at our last meeting on July 27th, there had been 388 deaths in Columbus. As of today, uh, July, uh, August or September 14th, uh, there have been 469 deaths in Columbus, which means that since council went on legislative recess, there have been 81 of our neighbors who have passed uh, due to this, um, this pandemic. And so we have to stay vigilant. We have to continue to follow the guidance of our um, uh, health commissioner and uh, continue to wear our mask and do those things that keep each other safe. With that, I'm gonna go around the horn. Are there any resolutions by members of council starting uh, with President Pro Tem Elizabeth Brown? Uh, nope, nothing tonight, council president. Thank you, council member. Councilmember Mitch Brown. Thank you, Council President. Uh, this evening, I do have one resolution of expression, 0127-2020, to honor the memory of those lost during the terror attacks of September 11th, 2001. Whereas the terror attacks on the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and the crash landing of Flight 93 in Shanksville, Pennsylvania on September 11th, 2001 accounted for nearly 3,000 lives lost. Whereas on the 19th anniversary of that fateful day, we not only remember the fallen, but the first responders and everyday heroes that risked their own lives to save others. And whereas we recognize those who serve in our armed forces, those actively serving and those that have served throughout our country's history, we owe them gratitude and respect for their service. May our nation and its people stay forever vigilant and take positive actions to prevent a tragedy such as this from ever happening again. And whereas we extend our support to those first responders still managing the mental and physical impacts of their brave service on that day, we pray that they find peace and comfort. And whereas may all Americans, regardless of race, gender, religion, orientation, or national origin, find this country to be a safe haven for freedom, justice, and prosperity. And whereas Americans face another national crisis in the COVID pandemic, may we come together to offer support and compassion to those who suffered loss and bring strength to those that are still fighting, now and therefore be resolved by this council of the city of Columbus. That this council does hereby honor the memory of those lost during the terror attacks of September 11, 2001, and recognizes the commitment of first responders for their actions on that fateful day and continue to grieve with those that are still struggling with the losses. If there are no comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. That's all I have, Council President. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member, for uh, bringing that resolution uh, as we all pause to remember 19 years ago. Council Member uh, Dorrance. Thank you, Council President Harden. Uh, no resolutions tonight, just a couple announcements. 
I uh, want to remind folks that we will council will be having its Northside uh, community meeting this Thursday at 5 p.m. online. Uh, each council member will host a breakout room so constituents uh, should feel welcome to join us. And uh, I know we're all looking forward to hearing from residents on the north side of town. Um, if folks are interested in RCP, they can email our director of community engagement, Aaron Gibbons, at emgibbons, G I B B O N S, at columns.gov. Uh, looking forward to seeing folks on Thursday at that <laughs> community meeting. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, this past week, my office, along with the community engagement team and the rest of council, launched the Vote Safe Columbus campaign. Uh, Vote Safe Columbus is a nonpartisan council initiative to ensure that every member of our community knows their options about how to cast their ballot this fall. We encourage everyone to make a voting plan this year because of the pandemic. Uh, residents can re request an absentee ballot, vote early, or on election day at a polling place. But we're really encouraging folks to use the vote by mail option to ensure we help limit the spread of COVID-19 while at the same time ensuring that folks can exercise a constitutional right to vote. For more information about different voting options and the deadlines associated with them, please visit columbus.gov slash vote. And with that, that's all I have this evening, President Harden. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dorrance, and thank you for your leadership on Vote Safe Columbus, that we will all be uh, right by your side uh, until Election Day. Uh, uh, Council Member Favor. Thank you, Council President Harden. No resolutions this evening, just one brief announcement. On Wednesday, September 30th at 5 p.m., I will host a hearing of the Housing Committee to discuss the creation of proposed community reinvestment areas. Please feel free to contact my office for additional details by reaching out to Tynesha Harden at T-Y-H-A-R-D-E-N at Columbus.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Remy. Thank you very much, Council President Harden. I have one resolution this evening, Ordinance 126X 2020 to honor, recognize, and celebrate Welcoming Week 2020 in Columbus, Ohio. Welcoming Week 2020, which takes place September 12th through the 20th, celebrates the growing movement of communities that fully embrace immigrants and their contributions to the social fabric of our country. Welcoming Week is an annual celebration, bringing together thousands of people in a series of local events that celebrate the contributions of immigrants, refugees, and new Americans, and the role our communities play in fostering a greater welcome. This year, these events have been replaced with virtual opportunities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Efforts that promote understanding and collaboration between all members of our community are crucial in encouraging and preserving the welcoming and inclusive nature of Columbus, Ohio. At a time when political rhetoric has deepened divisions and the COVID-19 pandemic has renewed anti-immigrant sentiment, Welcoming Week reminds us to double down on our inclusive vision and find new ways to bring together people across lines of differences to develop greater understanding and mutual support. During this week of recognition, the City of Columbus, Ohio, reaffirms its belief that the United States of America is a country open to all who seek refuge in the pursuit of happiness. Fostering a welcoming environment for all individuals, regardless of race, ethnicity, or place of origin, enhances the cultural fabric, economic growth, global competitiveness, and overall prosperity for current and future generations in the City of Columbus. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this Council does hereby recognize, honor, and celebrate Welcoming Week from September 12th to the 20th, 2020. This evening, we are fortunate to have Ms. Lillian Morales with the Latina Mentoring Academy to share a few words. Lillian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council Member Remy. We are all looking for a place to call home. Um, home is where you feel safe and accepted. For 11 years, Latina Mentoring Academy has brought together Latinas from all over the world who have chosen to call Columbus home, to build a community that recognizes the benefits of an inclusive society. And we're committed to creating spaces that are inclusive and create a sense of belonging for everyone. Welcome Week provides an opportunity to celebrate the values that unite us as neighbors, parents, colleagues, and to elevate a spirit of unity that helps to demonstrate what a multiracial democracy 
can be if everyone feels safe and welcome in the places they call home, including immigrants and refugees. Columbus has always strived to be an inclusive city that celebrates its rich diversity. That is one of the very many reasons why immigrants and refugees continue to drive Columbus's growing population. With this growth comes an immensely vibrant society that brings with them the uniqueness of their culture that has become woven in the fabric of our city. The Latina Mentoring Academy is proud to be one of the many organizations working to continue to make this a reality for each of us. Thank you, Council Member Remy, Council President Hardin, and all the members of Council for your continued support. Thank you so much, Lillian. We appreciate you being here this evening to talk about it. It's such a wonderful um, opportunity to celebrate the fact that Columbus draws from every continent almost equally. And with the growth of so many people moving here secondarily from other parts of the country, um, it's always an exciting adventure. I, being a foodie, um, I know that uh, I have a couple of friends that when we see a new restaurant pop up, up uh, especially in the north uh, Northland area where I live, uh, we, we run to try it out. And you can literally take a trip around the world by um, adventuring into some of the restaurants around Columbus, the culinary experience, and they're usually very, very good, is uh, typically second to none. So we appreciate the opportunity to celebrate this week and certainly uh, ask if any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Uh, may I uh, please call the roll? Brown, Brown, Doran's favorite, and President Harden. Adopted. Thank you so much. And that's all I have for us this evening. Thank you, Council Member. And certainly, last but not least, Council Member Tyson. Thank you, President Harden. First, I would like to um, just recognize an individual and then I have one resolution. Recently, Columbus and the residents of Central Ohio lost one of its great public health champions, Ms. Cheryl A. Boyce. I want to take a few minutes to reflect on her service, particularly as it relates to racism as a public health crisis in our community. Cheryl was a founding executive director Executive Director Emeritus of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health. The organization was created with legislation written and sponsored by State Representative Ray Miller in 1987. The Commission on Minority Health is focused and is committed to improving the health status of African Americans, Latino, Hispanics, Asians, and Native American Indians. Cheryl served as the executive director of the commission for more than 24 years and helped 30 plus states replicate this model. She was a pioneer in the Minority Health Month movement and organized the first Minority Health Month celebration in Ohio in 1989. Cheryl's passion and commitment to her work in health and human services field came about as a result of the premature death of her father. She was a fighter and she spent her professional career as a health equity champion. I want to express and send our deepest condolences to her family and her many friends like Angela Dawson, who is currently the executive director of the Office of Minority Health and the many others whose lives that she touched. Could we just take a few minutes to just um, a silence to just um, appreciate the work of Shirley Boyce? Thank you. The resolution that I'm introducing this evening, um, I will. I want to recognize the individuals who will be um, briefly speaking tonight, but we'll be receiving the resolution. It's resolution 131X-2020. It will be Nick Bankston, who is president of the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals. Habiba Bankston is founder of Beyond the Cell, and Annie Womack, president of the Ohio Sickle Cell and Health Association. This resolution is to proclaim September as a Sickle Cell Disease Awareness Month in the City of Columbus and to recognize the Columbus Herbal Young Professionals Beyond the Cell and the Ohio Sickle Cell Health Association for the advocacy and commitment to bring awareness to sickle cell disease. Whereas 
The observance of the National Sickle Cell Disease Awareness Month originated in 1975 with a month-long event to call attention to sickle cell, the sickle cell disease and the need, I'm sorry, the need to address the illness nationally and locally. And whereas sickle cell disease is a global health problem affecting more than 100,000 individuals in the United States, touching people of all races and some characterized and characterized by chronic fatigue and pain. Whereas it is estimated that more than 1,000 babies are born with sickle cell disease in the United States. The need for education and awareness, and while much has been done to improve treatment and lower complications and to reduce symptoms for persons affected with the disease, there continues to be a gap in care and a continuing need for ongoing innovation, treatment, research, and a cure. A cure for all. Some people have had it been cured, but not everyone. Whereas the Ohio Sickle Cell and Health Association was incorporated in 1977, the association was originally established to assist with providing payments and sorry, providing payment mechanisms for, for the medically indigent adults affected with sickle cell disease. And whereas the mission of the Ohio Sickle Cell Health Association is to provide education and statewide support to individuals and families affected by sickle cell disease. This is achieved through a commitment and consistent fo focus to testing, counseling, referrals, and advocacy. And whereas blood transfusions are the most common and effective treatment for sickle cell disease, the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals remains committed to ensuring that the Central Ohio has a strong and diverse blood supply, which is achieved through hosting and promoting blood drives. Whereas the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals are so also committed to spreading awareness regarding the importance of donating blood and its impact and necessity for treatment of many health conditions, such as sickle cell disease. Whereas Beyond the Cell is a movement that is dedicated to increasing education and awareness regarding sickle cell disease. Beyond the Cure harnesses the power of creativity and community to impact lives by sharing resources and creating a platform where individuals living with or impact, impacted by sickle cell disease can see themselves share their stories, and be inspired to their own truth, claim the power, and to live out loud. Whereas Beyond the Sale is launching its annual life drive to be held during the month of September, and this blood drive is designed to educate, encourage, and empower communities of color and beyond to not only give blood, but to give the gift of life. Whereas the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals and the Ohio Sickle Cell Health Association is in support of Beyond the Cell and its life drive efforts. Moreover, each of these organizations remains committed to continuing to promote the donation of blood for the use of life-saving treatments for sickle cell disease. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby proclaim Sickle, September as Sickle Cell Disease Awareness Month in the city of Columbus and recognizes the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals um, Beyond the Cell and the Ohio Sickle Cell Association for their advocacy and commitment to bringing awareness to sickle cell disease. I've now moved for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Doran's favorite Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. And now I'd like for um, Annie Womack, Habiba Bankston, and Nick Bankston to be able to share their comments. Thank you. Which order? Oh, it doesn't matter which, Annie, you can speak first. Oh, thank you. First of all, thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Ohio Sickle Cell, which started in 1960. So September is not only National Sickle Cell Month, but it's also Newborn Screening Month, as well as Cancer Children's Cancer Awareness Month. So all of those play a pivotal role in the screening and the early detection of childhood illnesses. 
5,000 babies a year are screened and have a detection of an abnormality or abnormal hemoglobin level. Of that 5,000, one-fourth of them are given a second chance of life by detecting a life-threatening illness. So that is 12,500 babies a year that, are, that have contracted a, a lifelong debilitating illness. Had it not been for the 1961 baby screening, so now we are 30 years of sickle cell screening out of the 57 years of newborn baby screening in the state of Ohio. So it's very important to understand and educate yourself on sickle cell disease. And we thank, we are so thankful to have a councilwoman that not only goes out and advocates for us with education, but can also speak from personal experience. So we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we are sharing this month with not only sickle cell, but with newborn baby screening, because that's the only way we detect it, the newborn screening, also childhood cancers, which are all hemoglobin blood disorders. And we also thank the partnership that we do have with the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals and Beyond the Cell, because it is a pivotal way of showing unification in this fight against sickle cell disease. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask Mr. Nick Bankston to speak. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Tyson and members of Council uh, for having us again. Always a pleasure uh, to be uh, virtually in Council Chambers, as I would say. Um, but want to just thank you for recognizing the work of the Columbus Urban League Young Professionals. You know, we stand committed to empowering communities and changing lives. And we want to make sure that we do that by ensuring that we have a diverse blood supply. Earlier this year, we hosted a blood drive encouraging uh, predominantly African Americans uh, to give blood. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, African Americans represent 25 to 50 percent uh, less um, than their uh, white counterparts in giving blood, but yet receive about 33 percent of blood donations. And although all of our blood is able to be used, there are specific things um, in each of our blood that are individual to our ethnicity. So we want to make sure that here in Central Ohio, we have a diverse blood supply, but also a strong blood supply. Uh, because of COVID-19, uh, blood drives have been canceled, which usually happen at places of work uh, and worship. Um, and so we want to do our part to ensure that as we come out of and battle this pandemic, uh, that we have a diverse and strong blood supply for uh, individuals of color in our community. So we couldn't be more happier uh, to partner uh, with Ohio Sickle Cell, with Beyond the Cell, uh, with Faith Thomas Foundation, so many other organizations uh, that are raising awareness around sickle cell um, and the importance of giving blood and that life-saving uh, treatment. Uh, so honored to be here and honored to have this recognition. And thank you so much, Councilmember Tyson, for your steadfast uh, advocacy for sickle cell. I know that you have been a strong advocate for this work for many, many years, um, and it impacts your family personally. So I want to say personally, thank you uh, for your support, uh, and we will continue to make sure that folks get out uh, and give blood and donate life. Thank you, Nick. And now we'll hear from Habiba Bankston. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Tyson, for the opportunity to be here and also for recognizing Beyond the Cell, which is an organization dedicated to um, increasing the education and awareness of sickle cell disease and also telling the true stories of those who are living with it and, and are impacted by it. Um, it's an organization I founded about two years ago, um, and this came from inspiration from my own personal experience with sickle cell. I've been battling sickle cell disease all of my life. Life. Um, at the age of 17, I experienced a silent stroke, um, which is a very common complication of sickle cell disease. And this year, I am celebrating my 15th anniversary as a stroke survivor and also a regular recipient of blood donations, which has honestly saved my life. It's, just, it's given me the strength and the ability to work and do so many other things like serving my community. Um, so, Beyond the Cell will be hosting its first uh, life drive, its first annual life drive. Um, and we call it life drive because um, the act of giving blood is so much more than just that. It truly is giving the gift of life. And um, our mission is really to 
normalize giving blood within the African-American community and other communities of color. And um, Nick Bankston kind of shared um, a bit of the stats and why it's so important um, for us to really encourage people of color to especially um, come out and give blood because those who are impacted by sickle cell disease and many other diseases, we, we need blood from communities of color. We need blood from people who look so it, the, the blood drive is going to be taking place on September 26th um, at, at the end of the month. And I'm very excited about this and also the support that we have gained from across the community, especially from city council. Um, as someone who is living with sickle cell disease and is battling it every day, it means everything to me um, to see city council recognize September as Sickle Cell Awareness Month. And um, Councilwoman Tyson, you have known me for years you have been by my side as I have battled along my journey. So thank you so much for your continued support um, and encouragement along the way. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here for this recognition. Um, it means everything. Thank you, Biba. Can you share um, where your blood drive will be? Yes, so the blood drive will be at the Urban Accelerator, which is located in the Near East Side. Um, the address is 818 Rose Avenue. And what time, you know? It'll be from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. And so I want to, again, um, just want to recognize Annie, Nick, and certainly Habiba, um, and certainly for her to be able to tell her story. Um, they just shared the importance of blood, blood, and it is a gift of life. And certainly, they, um, even though blood is universal, that there are differences, as I just stated. And when you have blood that possibly um, is not the same, not from the same ethnicities as the persons who was going to get it, that you can get some antibodies and that can create other challenges in your, in, in terms of your life. But it is certainly the gift of life. Um, many of you know that I have a son who has sickle cell disease and certainly, um, absolutely, if it weren't for blood, the blood that he receives every single month, he certainly would not be alive. So I am very thankful for the work that um, the Urban League is doing with the young professionals and with Nick's leadership, the work of Abiba, and certainly the awareness of Annie. And they did mention Faith Thomas. So, so we have given a resolution to Faith Thomas, and so I don't want to have to have left her out today. And um, but also what's important is that um, City Hall. Um, <laughs> The city hall is lit red. So we have, um, it's, it's lit red for the whole month of September to draw attention to sickle cell awareness and that um, individuals will ask why city hall red and we'll be able to share because of the importance of what's red because of blood and that to, um, draw people's attention to continue to, to donate blood and have an awareness of this particular, this disease. And so again, thank you to, um, Nick and Annie and Habiba for sharing their story. And we're so thankful to be able to give you the resolutions. And again, thanks so very much. And that's all I have, Council President Hardin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to, to all um, of the, the folks who um, received the resolutions for speaking with us. Uh, shout out to uh, Power Couple, uh, the Bankstons for representing uh, their organizations very well. Are there any comments or other comments by elected officials? I don't know if uh, the Madam Auditor had any additional comments before we get into the, the session. Uh, Treasurer uh, Clee, uh, is that um, in the City Attorney's Office? Seeing that at this time, I request the following ordinances be removed from the consent action portion of the agenda. Uh, may we remove ordinance 2070-2020 from the Health and Human Services? Are there any other requests by members of council for removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have the have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the clerk? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance number the 30 day legislation on tonight's agenda? Finance Committee Ordinances 1767, 1803, 1841, 1990, and 1991 2020. 
Education Committee Ordinance 1968-2020, Public Safety Committee Ordinance 1533-2020, Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 1749, 1758, 1806, 1842, 1843, 1867, 1873, 1882, 1883, 1898, 1901, 1911, 1914, 1937, 1941, 2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Mm -hmm. uh, seeing no uh, speakers on the uh, uh, seeing no no speakers, uh, may we now have a a motion to read? Are, are there speakers, Madam Clerk? Um, I don't know on first reading. I don't think so. The following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those ordinance numbers into? Resolutions of Expression 128X, 129X, 130X, 124X, 125X, 132X-2020, Finance Committee Ordinances 1738, 1742, 1747, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1820-1820, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 1821, 
Councilmember Remy. Yes. Ms. Tyson. Yes, with the exception of um, 1813, on which I am abstaining. And Yes, ordinance passed. We now proceed with the second reading of 30 day tabled and emergency legislation. Uh, the first committee to come before council is the finance committee. The committee is chaired by council president pro tem Brown. President pro tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, council president. Um, tonight it, we are starting with finance and we're actually starting with the previously discussed budget reduction. Um, that we began the meeting with the budget reduction of $41,500,000 to comply with Auditor Kilgore's reduction of the 2020 estimate of available resources. That is Ordinance 1436-2020 to authorize the net decrease of appropriations in the general operating fund to the City of Columbus for fiscal year 2020 by $41,500,000 in response to the City Auditor's revised estimate dated June 9th, 2020 to authorize the partial cancellation of several internal service encumbrances and other encumbrances to decrease appropriations to the Health Special Revenue Fund by $9,500,000 to decrease appropriations in the Recreation and Parks Operation and Extension Fund by $1,000,000 $25,000 to decrease appropriations in the Fleet Management Fund by $4,975,000 to decrease appropriations in the Print and Mailroom Services Fund by $270,000 to authorize the appropriation of $400,000 in the Health Special Revenue Fund and to declare an emergency. As was stated uh, previously, the COVID-19 pandemic hit early on in Columbus's fiscal year. So um, adjustments were implemented and necessary savings have been identified to cover most of this reduction. Um, city departments did not spend, in other words, spend allocated funds in anticipation of this adjustment. That didn't just happen on, an, on its own. I wanna point out um, that was the, the hard work of the finance team and departments themselves to work on those adjustments and to make sure that we could be here today um, making this anticipated adjustment with as little pain as possible and still meeting the very severe economic and health and human service crises of the COVID-19 pandemic. After completing the third quarter review, additional transfers will likely be needed based on further uh, revised projections. And today, emergency action is being considered to immediately adjust the general fund appropriation in line with the auditor's new estimate of available resources. Auditor Kilgore, I know that you spoke already, um, and I, I would welcome additional comments from you at this time if you have any. Um, please speak up because I don't always catch it with a hand raise on the screen um, if you have further comments. Thank you, Thank you, Finance Chair Brown and uh, members of Council. Uh, the Finance Director, as Mr. Lombardi and I spend a lot of time talking about, you know, what's happening in the local economy and what you have before you is a, a ordinance, appropriation ordinance that will bring structural balance back in line uh, with the revised revenue estimate, which we issued in the first part of June. Um, just a recap of that revised revenue estimate, and it's very infrequent. Um, thankfully, in the city of Columbus, that we have to have downward revenue adjustments mid-year. Um, we've been, you know, largely, uh, you know, fortunate the period of expansion these last several several years, um, but we found ourselves uh, as a result of COVID and having a declining revenues in just about all of our revenue categories. And of course, the lion, the driver behind the city's uh, revenue, is income tax, which is directly tied to jobs, um, you know, and, and so forth. So um, with that, uh, I'll let you uh, turn it back over to uh, the finance director to probably talk through this ordinance. Thank you. Great. Thank you, auditor. Um, director Lombardi, is there anything that you'd like to add uh, to the auditor's comments or my comments on the ordinance? Sure, uh, President Harden, President Pro Tem Brown, other members of council, um, 
not going to reiterate a lot that was already said this evening, uh, but I do want to take this time to really thank my colleagues. Um, we've been on them since March uh, to reduce uh, budgets that they thought uh, we they were going to have the ability to spend, and they have done a great job of uh, listening and doing the right thing for the city. Um, we began to anticipate this impact in March. Um, we didn't know what the duration of the COVID would be. We didn't know what the impact would be on our economy. So we began to start making uh, reductions in March. Uh, as, as many said, we, we travel banned, we froze hiring for most positions, we asked people to reduce or to freeze any uh, annual spend. And we were able to garner 26 and a half million just in the first quarter, which we thought was going to be enough. Um, and, and then obviously we, we got the revised uh, letter in June and we began to ask departments to continue working toward this 41.5 million. Um, we will continue to work with the auditor. I wanted to thank her for all the work that she has put into this and helping me and, and keeping me updated. Um, we continue to look forward to seeing where we land at the end of the year. Anything on the positive side of zero uh, will be good. Uh, that will help us not only this year, but also going into building the 2021 budget. Um, and uh, some have asked why we brought it so early this year. I wanted to make sure that the gap was filled first. This way we can deal with the third quarter um, and it's a little bit more manageable to deal with uh, a smaller number than it is with uh, such a big number. But again, I can't thank my colleagues enough for everything that they put into this. I really appreciate their help. Thank you, Director Lombardi. I think that's very well said um, about the work across all departments and among your team members. Um, and I, I will just add, uh, not to belabor this point, but we are in, in case you <laughs> haven't noticed about 2020, um, we are in unprecedented times and we don't know what lies ahead in terms of um, that the health situation developing and in terms of the economic situation recovering or not. Um, and all the while, a, a crisis like this, a pandemic like this, not only hits our budget, but it's hitting people. It's hitting real people hard. Um, and the hardest, the people who are hit the worst and really were hit the first by this crisis as well, are folks who could least afford the disruption. Um, so I want to take an opportunity to highlight um, not only the good work that the departments have done to get us to this point, and, and you, Director Lombardi, with as little pain as possible in our budget, because we adjusted right away, but also the really good work of this council um, to uh, work through the federal funds that were given, uh, that were distributed um, in response to make sure that, you know, what we see in our budget represents the real pain in community. Um, and I just really appreciate the work of this council to respond to that. Um, and the mayor detailed th that in his remarks, but I wanted to add my thanks. Um, well, before I, I move for, for passage of this ordinance, I want to give council members an opportunity to ask questions of the auditor or uh, the director um, or, or myself, of course, if there are any. And please, again, speak up, not just hands. Uh, President Pro Tem, I'd least like to ask uh, Megan Kilgore, uh, Auditor Kilgore, a question. What's the impact in her estimation regarding the bond ratings? Thank you, great question. Auditor? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Councilmember Brown. That's a great question. Uh, the uh, bond ratings are made up of a variety of categories, including the local economy. So I will call it the external economy. It's also made up of management. And that score is something that really you and your colleagues, uh, especially finance, former finance chair Tyson, earned through the period of time of 08 and 09. What that category is, is will the legislative body work with the administration to come together in tough times to make tough decisions? And historically, the city of Columbus has always done that. And as you recall, when you were director, Brown, um, there were very tough decisions that were made. 
So the rating agencies acknowledge that the city of Columbus has a history of strong management during times of economic crisis. In addition to those two categories, there's debt and pensions, which is really the capital side, as well as something we don't have control over, which is the pensions. We, we pay what our statewide pensions require. And the last category are our city's financials. And so anytime we have declining revenues, that will affect the ratios in that last category. But it's one of you know, those four categories. I think it's really important to look at how we are performing compared to our peer and our meaning like size cities across the country. And here's the fact, you know, we are not um, in as bad of shape as several of our larger similarly sized cities across the country. And that's because they might have uh, revenue that, that are more sales tax, consumption, tourism taxes, taxes that had the immediate consequences of COVID. And also our employment base here, our composition of our employers, largely financial services, insurance, healthcare, um, government, which is really important, education. A lot of our major employers were able to quickly pivot and work remotely, work from home, um, while healthcare needed to double down and invest. And that's why you do see some job growth occurring at our local hospital systems right now. Uh, but to finance chair and President Pro Tem Brown's point, that's what makes COVID the most inequitable economic event of our country's history, because the average person to lose their job because of COVID um, here in Columbus was the, the, the most, you know, uh, the person, the demographic that lost the most amount of jobs was the black woman. And so when you look at our tax base and you try and correlate that to unemployment, it's not really apples to apples. Those who lost their jobs were factually not the strongest part of our tax base. And so the inequities continue to persist because of COVID. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Brown. I'm happy to take anything uh, further as well. No, I don't. thank you very much. I appreciate the explanation. I think it's important for all my colleagues to have some clarity to the impact, uh, especially with regards to the bond issue and the bond rating for our city. Uh, having gone through this a number of years ago, it wasn't pleasant then and it's not pleasant now, but thank you for your guidance and, and your involvement. Sure. Can I, I'm gonna, Thank you. can I say it's a couple things? Can I make some comments? Um, first of all, um, I certainly want to thank the leadership of um, um, our financial leadership, the, the auditor, Councilman Brown, your office, as well as um, Director Lombardi. Um, these are unprecedented times, but again, I will always say the genius of our city um, was that, you know, we have an income tax. Now, mind you, we know that the income tax has been lowered based upon individuals who have lost their jobs. But in the past, as this, our economy was certainly moving along pretty well, we were also able to um, put dollars back in our basic, our basic services fund and we put dollars back on our rainy day fund. So we were able to, we are prepared for a situation. Um, no one was prepared for this situation, but we always knew something could happen and we would be able to try to respond to that when that did happen. So I appreciate the genius of, of um, our past elected officials and administrations to be able to um, to think out, to, to understand that something could possibly happen. And I do, um, I hear um, Auditor Kilgore's comments about who certainly are the individuals who are who have suffered the greatest are black females and they were already not doing well prior to the to the pandemic and here we are now um, now in, in a, a worse situation but I do appreciate also the work that this council has done to make sure that the black women are making sure that they're not being evicted because of the COVID we're providing other resources not only to them but their family so um, I think we're all trying to step up and do the very best that we can in these unprecedented times uh, but again I appreciate the work of our of our um, the entire finance team thank you Thank you, council member. Um, and I'm really glad you, you pointed that out. I, I think what's um, 
you know, hard but smart about this ordinance is that we're starting, we started with these smart reductions this year, um, rather than, as you said, you know, we do have the basic city services fund and the rainy day fund. Um, but the first place we looked wasn't there. The first place we looked was how we could save money in, in a sustainable way, um, given that we don't know what's ahead. So uh, thank you for um, adding that. I think that's a really important thing for residents to, to understand and to know. Is there anything else from uh, colleagues? Madam Chair, uh, if I if I could, it's just to quickly add in one more appreciation and, and that truthfully has to go to our congressional delegation um senator brown uh congresswoman Beatty, who who fought for cares act dollars we have to understand that the the place that we are in um is also uh, on top of or with us receiving 157 million dollars of cares act dollars uh and the work that um our colleagues and the administration did to to pinpoint those dollars out to make sure that um the folks that we talked about that are most um most adversely affected by this pandemic uh can weather uh, could weather it uh, or to put that that uh, that net under it so that we can get to the other side and and know that it all has an impact into this budget and the budget that uh, we will work together on for 2021. So just wanted to add that other appreciation and point of, of, of notice that we were in this place and we received $157 million uh, to get us through. So we are definitely in uh, unparalleled times, uh, yet we will, we will continue to, to work diligently and to be prudent with uh, the city's budget uh, and we will get through this so thank you so much for your leadership thank you council president absolutely a direct line between that cares act and the help we were able to provide to residents um mm -hmm. which provides us an opening to say that the pain won't be over on december 31st um most likely and uh there's a lot of pain in the nation right now and i i really urge um uh, uh, folks in the Senate, particularly uh, Mitch McConnell, to bring a true uh, uh, next COVID package to the floor because communities need it and more than communities, people need it. Um, with that, I think I will move for, for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Ordinance is passed. Thank you. Uh, next in finance, we have ordinance 2023-2020 to authorize the director of the Department of Finance and Management to execute those documents necessary to enter into a license agreement between the City of Columbus and the Franklin County Board of Elections for temporary use of the community room located at 2300 West Broad Street and to declare an emergency. The 2020 general election is faced with unprecedented challenges in the midst of the ongoing pandemic. Ensuring there are enough properly trained poll workers is a crucial part of enabling a safe and secure election. We faced a poll worker shortage during the uh, primary earlier this year, which caused chaos among boards of elections across our state. Through this ordinance, the Franklin County Board of Elections will begin partnering with the City of Columbus to immediately begin trolling, uh, uh, training, excuse me, not trolling, <laughs> uh, training poll workers for the 2020 general election um, at this location at 2300 West Broad Street. It's really important to do this work. Um, I am I am uh, really grateful to the Vote Safe Columbus initiative um, and efforts to uh, help educate people about their options to vote on or to vote, um, excuse me, by mail, um, which is uh, the safest way. There are some folks who uh, will still need to and want to vote in person. And the worst, uh, one of the worst things we could do for safety is to uh, not have enough poll workers, trained poll workers, and therefore need to consolidate polling locations or pack more people in. Voting is the bedrock of our democracy. People should not have to choose between feeling safe and exercising their fundamental rights. So we will continue to do whatever we can to ensure everyone has the opportunity to vote safely through partnerships like this and through the vote safe columbus initiative um, which i want to thank councilmember dorans uh, uh, for leading it's a multi-faceted multi-pronged effort are there any comments or questions from colleagues before i move for passage all right uh, i move for passage 
Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Great. Thank you. May I move to Education Committee, Council President? Please. We have one ordinance in education, 1722-2020, uh, to authorize and direct the Director of Education to enter into contracts with high-quality pre-kindergarten organizations to provide educational services, to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Codes, to authorize the expenditure of up to $2,683,096 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. This funding is for uh, the Early Start Columbus program, which expands access to high quality pre-kindergarten classrooms in partnership with community-based providers and with Columbus City Schools. In short, we are helping make high quality pre-K affordable for eligible low-income families. These dollars are leveraged with funds from the Ohio Department of Education and the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services to make every dollar stretch as far as possible and maximize the number of children and families we serve. Early Start Columbus providers have demonstrated their ability to provide a high quality pre-kindergarten education by being rated at least three stars in the state's Step Up to Quality program. I, I want to note that the COVID-19 disruptions to providers and families alike have reinforced that child care is vital infrastructure that supports families and our entire economy. The system wasn't really working before this crisis and the crisis has laid bare the many ways in which that is true. Because we know that quality early education significantly improves literacy, language, and math skills. Children who reach kindergarten academically ready are more likely to succeed in school and throughout the long term, throughout their lives. Additionally, having a safe place to drop your kid off each day, knowing they're not only safe, but, but being enriched and learning, that helps parents secure employment and advance their own careers and earnings, ultimately providing increased economic security for families across our city. That's the basis of our efforts to expand high quality pre-K and as I have said in the past, I truly believe that funding for early childhood is one of the best investments we can make as a city and as a society. I'm proud to uh, continue supporting the Early Start program and I'm grateful to Matt Smido and Sierra Adams with the Department of Education for their ongoing work um, on these important investments, the hard work they do around the clock to allow us to make these investments. Are there any questions or comments from colleagues? Hearing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. And Council President, I have an ordinance and rules and reference. I don't know if you want me to do that now or later. Uh, sure, let's, get, let's go ahead and do it. Okay. Um, tonight in rules and reference, we have ordinance 1829-2020 to create in Columbus City Codes chapter 1913 restrictions on the deployment and use of equipment by police. This was introduced on July 27th and is on second reading tonight. Are there comments or questions from colleagues? Councilmember, I know that Councilmember Brown, Mitch Brown, has uh, a comment. And Eric seems like he's trying to get to his. I see. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Council President. Um, I would move to uh, to table this ordinance indefinitely, uh, and in so doing, uh, that if we do it through a voice vote, uh, this issue uh, requires a lot more attention than we're currently being able to dedicate to it. Is there a is there a second, second for voice vote? Second. Can I make a comment before we call for a vote. Certainly, I apologize, President. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's fine. Thank you. Um, I, I just I want to stress. Thank you, Council Member Brown. 
Um, I want to stress that my introduction of chapter 1913 in Columbus City Codes tonight represents one piece of our efforts to reimagine public safety. Its aim is to reinforce the covenant of trust between peace officers we employ and the residents they serve. And I think we all have seen firsthand the broad agreement among all residents that we all want safer neighborhoods. But we know that despite that, polarization persists in the conversation around how to achieve that. Currently, some residents, and we've heard the, from them, are uncomfortable with what feels like unprecedented questioning of the policing institution by other residents in our city and by uh, those we elect to serve. But it bears reminding, if you'll permit me, that actually there is more about this conversation that is old than new. For as long as governments have taxed their people, we have wondered what they've done with our money. Were the tax dollars stretched as far as they could go? Were they spent on something that enhanced public welfare? In a democratic society, this kind of scrutiny is expected and enshrined by our laws. So again, today, our residents, so many of them are asking similar questions. Is our money doing the highest good that tax dollars can do? My initiative to demilitarize the presence of police has been from the start rooted in the idea that to meet that standard, to do the highest good with taxpayer dollars, the way we outfit and equip our police officers cannot look and feel to residents as if we are at war. This was the case at Broad and High a few months ago, which has been the center of protest activity in our community. But it's also the case in our neighborhoods throughout the year. This council heard record hours of testimony and received record amounts of feedback on this topic. Proposed chapter 1913 codifies direction, directives, excuse me, on control agents, expands them to specialty munitions and creates additional accountability and transparency around the use of military style weapons. By doing these things, this legislation I truly believe helps our police division better embody the peacekeeping at the heart of every officer's role and the heart of why I know most officers sign up for serving in the first place. The legislation also caps our aviation unit to four helicopters down from five. And this has been uh, a hotly debated topic. On the one hand, helicopters bring measurable value to police responses in specific situations. Officers themselves have shared with me how the aviation unit enables them to get eyes on a crime scene in a matter of minutes after they get a call or, or, or to respond to certain emergencies in ways a cruiser simply can't. On the other hand, we heard from residents the unit is expensive. Residents object to the noise, the surveillance, the stress response that their presence creates. And to balance these myriad perspectives, this legislation sustains the role of helicopters in police while modestly reducing their number by one to free up significant resources. When we go back to that age old question that all residents by right and without exclusion have the authority to ask their leaders, are our taxpayer our dollars being put to the highest and best use? It is evident that any public safety discussion that exists solely within the bounds of what we do after a crime has occurred is sorely lacking in moral imagination and in comprehensiveness. We need to look upstream. We can see that effort with the modest changes contained in this legislation. Yes, it requires us to make tough choices, but doing so will enable a more effective strategy, I believe to keep all of our residents safe in the long run. Thanks, thank you, Council President, for allowing me those comments. Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair and sponsor of this ordinance. There is a motion and a second to table uh, ordinance 1829-2020 indefinitely. Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Bye, boys. Ms. Brown. Vote no to tabling the ordinance. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorrance. No. Ms. Faber. No. Mr. Remy. Yes. Ms. Tyson. 
Yes. President Harden. Yes. Ordinance is tabled. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we have enough time. I apologize. I believe there is a public speaker. Uh, since we are tabling it, I am moving forward without calling the speakers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we might have enough time before zoning, though, to, to get to the safety committee. If there are only two ordinances, I believe, in that committee before. So uh, the next committee to come before council is the safety committee. Uh, Chair Mitch Brown chairs that committee. Council member, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, tonight I have in public safety 1828-2020 uh, to authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into a contract for maintenance and repair services for our crime lab instruments with specialty underwriters LLC to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code, Chapter 329, to authorize the expenditure of $81,216,000. $81,216 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Director Stewart is on the line. Would you please speak to the issue with regards to competitive bidding and the waiver requested? Yes, sir. Uh, Council President Harden, President Pro Tem Brown, Council members. President Brown, uh, the Division of Police currently has a variety and various scientific instruments that require maintenance and repair services. Uh, this equipment is used to process and present evidence in criminal prosecutions and requires strict adherence to rules of evidence and established mandatory timelines. Uh, the crime lab, again, has these on instruments that are requiring repair. The best people to repair them are the people who manufactured them, which is why the, uh, uh, the request is being made uh, specifically to have the manufacturers repair the equipment. Thank you, Director Stewart. If there are no questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Also this evening, sir, I have Ordinance 1940 to authorize the Finance and Manager Director to associate all general budget reservations regarding uh, this ordinance with Galls RT2 LLC for the purchase of replacement uniforms and accessories for the division of police from existing universal term contracts and to authorize the expenditure of one million four hundred four thousand one hundred sixty dollars from the general fund and to declare an emergency director stewart would you also provide some clarity to and background information regarding replacement uniforms for our division yes sir uh specifically this is to do just that replace uniforms that uh, are that need to be replaced due to wear and tear. I've also um, asked Chief Quinlan uh, to uh, be here to be able to, to address that, and I believe he is. Chief. Thank you, Okay, I think I got the mute off. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, council member. Thank you, uh, all council for their uh, support and consideration of the fact that uh, we were recently uh, awarded uh, from Fleckheimer, the um, best dressed uh, police agency in the country. And I think the renewal of our uniform is specific for that uh, personal protective gear, reflective, uh, vest, um, the white shirts uh, that we wear, which is, is very few agencies in the country uh, that do have uh, the white uh, shirts, um, the entire gear package that we provide officers uh, annually, uh, which is part of our collective bargaining agreement as well. Um, so that's what this uh, funding will do is supply officers with the needed equipment to uh, maintain the presence in our community visible presence. Chief, would you also speak to the accessories that this does not include uh, armaments? Uh, correct. This is a uh, this is a purchase with Galls, the vendor who has the bid uh, contract for uh, approval for uniforms uh, that does not include uh, weapons, does not include uh, the body armor that 
um, SWAT or anyone else uses. That's through a whole different vendor process. Um, the body armor was, was supplied separately. Uh, so this is, again, for uh, raincoats, for uh, shirts, and winter coats, and hats, and the normal gear that uh, 1,900 officers wear every day, summer and winter. Thank you, Chief. If there are no questions from my colleagues, then I move for passage and I ask for a voice vote. Second. Please call the roll. Ms. Brown. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Brown. Yes. Mr. Dorans. Yes. Ms. Faber. Yes. Mr. Remy. Yes. Ms. Tyson. Yes. President Hart. Yes. Ordinance is passed. Council President, if I may, I have one more ordinance in Veterans Senior Affairs, and I will be very quick, sir. Three minutes. Just joking. You got it. Thank you. Ordinance 1915-2020 to authorize a supplemental appropriation in the amount of $12,896,000 to the Recreation and Parks Grant Fund for the operation of various grant programs administered by the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging to authorize the city auditor to transfer appropriations between the object classes for the Ohio Department of Aging, Franklin County Office on Aging, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Aging Programs and to declare an emergency. This ordinance will reduce the Recreation and Parks Fund, fund unappropriated balance by $12,896,000. Uh, the appropriation of supplemental grants from the Ohio Department of Aging, Franklin County Office of Aging, and Department of Housing and Urban Development will enable the Recreation and Parks Department to continue those programs as administered by the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging and to carry on various services for the balance of 2021. Uh, also, we have present is uh, Director Rakowski uh, from Rec and Parks. Do you have any comments, sir? Uh, Director Brown, you hit on all the points. Even though this is a large ordinance, it is a fairly routine ordinance that you will see happen over the course of the funding cycle of these appropriation ordinances. Nine different programs and various grants, but uh, we appreciate your support on this to uh, keep our sister organization, COAAA, uh, moving forward and serving our seniors at a very difficult time. Uh, if there are no additional questions, I move for passage. My voice. Please. My voice. <laughs> yes, by <laughs> voice. Thanks. Second. Please call her all by voice. I think you're on mute, Madam Chair. Ms. Brown? Stain. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance passed. Thank you. That's all I have this evening, sir, and I did it in three minutes. You got it done, right on the right on the dot. Um, if there are uh, no more, uh, actually, may I have a motion to recess so we can go to zoning? So moved. Second. Let's call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. All right, we are adjourned. We will uh, convene zoning in three minutes.
motion to convene meeting number 34. So moved. Second. What's your second? Please second. call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Saber, Remy, Tyson, President Park. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We are um, now on our zoning committee, Council Member Tyson chairs that committee, all members serve on it. Sever, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Um, before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side, and we provide an, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. Sorry. And wait a minute. On the advice of the city attorney's office, anyone here who wishes to speak for or against a council variance, including staff, must be sworn in prior to giving testimony. We do so prior to the beginning of the reading of each variance on the agenda. So anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, Please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Ordinance 1946-2020 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3353.03 permitted uses of the Columbus City Codes for property located at 5260 Go Down Road to conform an existing single unit dwelling in the LC2 Limited Commercial District. The applicant is Michael McCandish. The proposed use is a single unit dwelling. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Northwest Civic Association's recommendation is approval six to zero. I first move to waive second reading. Second. Thank you. Remy Tyson, President Harden. And now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hurd. Pass. Thank you. The next one is 1951-2020 to rezone 2700 Bryce Road, being 1.57 acres located in the southeast corner of Bryce Road and Tussing Road from the, from the C4 Commercial District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. Oops. The applicant is the Skill Can Go Development LLC, care of Sarah Gold. The proposed use is fuel sales, convenience store, and eating and drinking establishment. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Far East Area Commission's recommendation is approval 10 to 0. If there are no questions or comments, I first move to waive second reading. Second. Ms. Calderon. Wait. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Remy Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1952-2020 to rezone 875 Jason Way, being 7.37 acres located in the southeast corner of Jason Way Avenue and Schuster Lane from the LM2 Limited Manufacturing District to the um, to LM Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant is the Safco Brothers, care of attorney Craig Moncrief. <laughs> The, the proposed use is office, warehouse, storage, and repair shop. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Northwest Civic Association's recommendation is also approval, seven to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I first move to waive second reading. Second. Thank you. And now I move. Please call the roll. Oh, I'm sorry. Remy Tyson, President Harden. Waived. And now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Passed. 
Thank you. The next ordinance is 1953-2020 to rezone 1775 Hilliard and Rome Road, being 1.26 acres located at the west side of Hilliard and Rome Road, 680 feet north of Westchester Woods Boulevard, from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is North Star Realty, care of David Hodge Attorney. The proposed use is a commercial development. The State Department's recommendation is approval, and the Far West Air Commission's recommendation is also approval, seven to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move to amend to emergency. Second. Ms. Call the roll. Tyson, President Hart. Amend it. Thank you, and then I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Ordinance 1955-2020 is to grant a variance from the, for the provisions of sections 3332.037 R2F Residential District, 3332.14 R2F Area District Requirements, 3332.21 CD Building Lines, 3332.25 Maximum Side Yards Required, 3332.26 Minimum Side Yard Permitted, and 3332.27 Rear Yard of Columbus City Coat. For the property located at 80 North Winter, to permit two two unit dwellings on one lot with reduced development standards in the R2F Residential District. The applicant is Juliet Bullock. The proposed use is two two unit dwellings on one lot, and the C department's recommendation is approval, and the Near East Air, Near East Area Commission's recommendation is also approval at 10 to 0. If there are no questions or comments, I first move to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown Brown, Dorn, Saber Remy Tyson, President Harden. Waived. Thank you, and now I would move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. All right, so the next, the next ordinance is 1962-2020 to rezone 835 North Cassidy Avenue, being 0.39 acres located at the west side of North Cassidy Avenue, 95 feet north of East 6th Avenue, from the P1 Parking District to the M Manufacturing District. The applicant is CCC Columbus LLC, care of attorney Jeff Brown. The proposed use is outdoor storage, and the city department's recommendation is approval, and the East, East Columbus Civic Association's recommendation was also approval. I would now like, so I think we have two individuals who are um, in council chambers, and so I would now... Um, First, like a uh, staff presentation on this particular ordinance. I'm not sure if I the, can't hear them. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if somebody's still muted in speaking through the presentation. Apologize for that. Um, there we go. The site consists of a portion of one parcel zoned in the P1 parking district. This property is the subject of recent code enforcement action for establishing outdoor storage uses in the P1 parking district without receiving a certificate of zoning clearance. The requested M manufacturing district 
will allow the outdoor storage of materials on the site, which is associated with the industrial facility developed on the remaining portion of the parcel. A concurrent council variance has been submitted to reduce open storage setbacks. The site is within the planning area of the East Columbus Neighborhood Plan, which recommends light industrial land uses at this location. The site is also located within the Port Columbus Joint Economic Development Strategy, which recommends office and light industrial land uses. The requested M Manufacturing District will allow an outdoor storage use that is compatible with the land use recommendations of both the plan and the strategy, and is consistent with the zoning pattern of the surrounding area. Therefore, City Department's recommendation is approval, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for um, Haley? Seeing none, I would now like a um, attorney, Jeffrey Brown is the attorney um, representing uh, the client for this property. This is Mr. Jeffrey Brown. Would you please like to have a presentation? Attorney Brown. Sure, Ms. Tyson. Um, just so you know, this property was zoned decades ago as part of the overall large manufacturing facility. It was originally zoned for employee parking. And over the years, it has turned into uh, storage for the facility. Uh, and so what we're doing here with the zoning and the council variance is rectifying that because we don't need it for employees parking and we do need it for storage. Um, I met with the uh, Civic Association, explained what was going on, answered their questions. They recommended approval. Uh, we went to the Development Commission with the request. Um, no one showed up at that meeting, and they again recommended approval. Uh, what this company does is, is take carbons and provide that for filtration, uh, whether you're talking about air or water, uh, especially with water treatment facilities, that's what they do. And what's being stored there in those bags is carbon. Uh, what they can do is when the carbon gets used up and uh, it gets part of the impurities as it go through the filtration process for your water, for example, they take it, recondition it, and be able to reuse it. So that's what the storage is. So the existing situation really would not change. Uh, it would merely reflect what's actually going on in the property. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. And so I now have um, there are two two speakers um, who are um, against this ordinance. And the first speaker, uh, no, Council President Hart. I don't know if, if it's Susan Rouse. Is that the first speaker? She's in Council Chambers. Yes, Madam Chair. I can kind of uh, do assist now and bring. You know, Thank you. Would Ms. Susan Rouse please come to the podium? Good afternoon, Ms. Uh, Rouse. Thank you for coming to council. Uh, you, you're here to speak uh, against Ordinance 1962. If you would just state your name, your address, and if you're representing any organization, and you will have three minutes to uh, give your comments. We can't hear her. Uh, Ma Madam Rouse, one second. I apologize. Uh, could, could somebody make sure that the... I thought that could be controlled from... He is unmuted, sir, but Mark will come down to check the volume level. I think we're good to go now. Thank, thank you, Ms. Angie. And thank you, Ms. Rouse. Uh, thank you. If you would, if you would just do your name, your ad, it's still not working. I, I apologize. One second. Our, our IT person is, is just coming. It is 2020, so we have these issues sometimes. Can 
you hear us now? Yes, I can hear him. Yeah. My name is Susan Rice. We can't hear her now. Mark, Mark, it's not working. I apologize, Ms. Krauss. I wonder if they're picking up through my speaker, maybe. Uh, both of our speakers are in person. Um, Madam Chair, if you if if you would indulge me, would you mind moving to a next piece of legislation, and then I'll give oh, a signal when we can come sure, back to. Sure. Okay. Yes, I can history. absolutely do that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Um. Let me see. That's just not, all right. Ordinance 1969-2020 to rezone 8001 Ravine's Edge Court being 1.84 acres located in the northwest side of the Terminus Ravine's Edge Court from uh, located okay from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to Commercial Plan Development and uh, Development District. The applicant is Emily Program, care of Kate Norris. The proposed use is an inpatient medical treatment facility. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Far North Columbus Communities Coalition's recommendation is also approval, a uh, seven to zero. If there are no Questions from my colleagues. I first move to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown Dorans, favor Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. And now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown Dorans, favor Remy Tyson, President Harden. Ordinance is passed. Can we do a sound check right now for 1962? I apologize. Are you, you want to go back to it? I, I just want to do a sound check. Oh, okay. Go ahead. One, two, three. Can you hear I me? Think, I think we are in business. All right, we're back to Ordinance nineteen sixty two. If that's if that's under the direction of the chair, is it? Yes. So that is fine. All right, okay. Madam Kraus, uh, Miss Kraus is speaking on Ordinance nineteen sixty two. She's speaking against it, uh, and and now we're good to go. So if you give your name, your address, if you represent anybody, and then you're good to go. Welcome, Miss Kraus. Kraus. Hello. My name is Susan Rouse and I live at 791 Northview Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43219. And I'm uh, concerned today about uh, the rezoning because they, in the letter it stated that uh, they wanted to expand their property to within 125 feet of my house. And if that's correct, um, we now have a sort of woodsy area right there. And if I don't know if they're proposing to change that and come to the edge of that property. Or is it just the parking lot that they're talking about? Uh, Ms. Rush, uh, if, if that's all, if, if that's the question that you'd like answered, we can, um, you can yield back the remaining of your time and, and I can, we can see if we can get that answer to you during this portion. Right. So once you get the up, so can you hear me? Yes. So, okay, so what will happen is, you've sh you, what will happen is um, the uh, attorney, Jeffrey Brown, will respond back to your concern of it being 125 feet um, uh, by your house. So he will address that in just a few minutes. Okay, so you want me to come back? Well, no, he'll share it. I, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think I do think I know his answer. So I'll just wait. Can you, if you can just give us a, we're going to have for another speaker that's against it also. And then Mr. Mr. Brown will address, I'm sure, both of the, both of the concerns. 
Okay. Okay. So we'll answer that in just a few minutes. The next speaker. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Madam Chair, you can stay. Could you we can now um, hear from Mr. Curtis Adams. Thank you. Mr. Curtis Adams. Mr. Curtis Adams is here to speak on Ordinance 1962 as well. Mr. Adams, welcome, welcome to council. Hello. Uh, my name is Curtis Adams and I live at 805 Northview Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43219. And I live at the end of the street where it curves around over to Drexel. And the property that you're talking about is right, the little wooded area is right over there. And I could hear the factory all the time, but then a few years back, there was black soot that landed on everything over there, you know, all of our property, the chairs, your cars, and everything. And I was concerned what do they really do? What's going on there? And if they just talk about bringing things over, how much closer is going to get to me? Because I'm right there with you. It's definitely going to be right there affecting me. And if they bring it over here, then, you know, I'm just curious, on, you know, what that's about. Okay. Oh, also, I should have asked Kerbin. Mr. Adams, were you aware that, um, that the applicant presented to your, uh, your civic association? Did you get that information, a notice about this zoning previously? Any information? Not that I know of. Okay. All right. Well, what we'll do is we're gonna we'll ask the applicant to come back to the um, to well, he's not there, but we'll ask the applicant to address um, your issue about well the black soot and it coming closer to your home, and we'll also he'll also address Miss Rouse's um, concern about it being 125 feet of her house. Correct, and if if if, if they said I sit that close to her, that means I'm even closer. <laughs> you know. Okay, and just concerned about if they're gonna bring it over the property. I mean, you don't want that closer to you want to keep it over where it's at right now, you know, so why would they bring it over further, you know, All right. know change the whole scenery and everything over there. Okay, well, we're going to let Mr. Okay, Mr. Um, we can let Mr. Attorney Brown address those questions. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Tyson. Um, I think if Haley could put the zoning map up, I think we can clarify this very quickly. Um, when the property owner owns more than one parcel, the city code requires us to notify anybody that's within 125 feet of that parcel. So you can see all that purple. Uh, that is all owned by the, the same property owner as had to a lot of people that aren't very close to what we're doing. The piece of property we're talking about, and we're not talking about moving any building or moving the, the, the manufacturing building closer to anybody, that gray area will front on Cassidy is the only thing that we're talking about. So you see that it's already surrounded by other men and manufacturing and doesn't go back into the neighborhood. So if we, we're using it for outside storage and we're gonna continue to use that outside storage of city council uh, would re approve this request. So there's no buildings on this property. It's not moving any closer to anybody. And the reason these two uh, property owners got notice, I believe, is just because we had to notify the larger parcel, uh, not just the rect gray rectangle that you see on your screen. Thank you, Attorney Brown. Thank you. So again, for um, Ms. Rouse and Mr. Adams, again, I think he has explained that it's only 125 feet based upon um, the entire partial parcel of land and it will not change the, the current um, 
property that is um, within within this particular area. So it would not affect Mr. Um, Adams or Mr. Rouse. Is that correct, Mr. Brown? Yes, that's my yes. Because what we're what we're not changing anything than what we're currently doing right now on that rectangle piece. Thank you. Are there any questions from my colleagues to Attorney Brown? Uh, if I may, uh, Chair Tyson, just to ask Mr. Brown, the the uh, individuals expressed some concerns from a environmental concern. Is there something that can be addressed with that, uh, Mr. Brown? Um, I don't. I'll, I'll, I'm, I am not aware of any issues with that property. Uh, what's on this outside storage are bags of carbon. As I said, that their primary business is um, filtration and um, emission controls, et cetera. So what they do is they provide this carbon uh, that gets used, for example, by the city of Columbus in their water treatment facility. Uh, the carbon sucks out the impurities and they have a process which they can take the impure carbon and change it back in, recycle it into carbon that can be reused. And so that's occurring in the facility. Uh, this piece of property that we're talking about just merely has bags of carbon um, stored out there. Thank you. Mr. Brown, um, is, so uh, one thing I would ask is if we could get, if we could get Miss, um, Mr. Adams' information to provide that to you. Um, and maybe you could still address, I and mean, he mentioned that at some point there had been black soot closer to him. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd be happy to so talk you to him about say, that, put him in contact with the plant manager. Yes, that would be great. Like that. That would be That's great. Good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Council Member Tyson. Yes. Council Member um, Favor. Yes. Thank you. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask Council President Harden if, um, because since we can't see the the chambers, mm -hmm. if the question, does it appear as though the question has been resolved uh, from the first uh, speaker? Thank, thank, thank you, Council Member. Uh, the, both of the speakers are currently speaking with uh, staff and I think kind of following up on what Chair Tyson um, asked of, um, of, of uh, d d uh, Mr. Brown to follow up. And so oh. I, can't, I can't say specifically, but, I, but they're speaking with staff right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Tyson. Thank you, Council Member Favor. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Okay, well, seeing none, I would move for passage. Oh, do we have to wave oh, wait, second reading? I'm sorry. I need a wave second read. I'm sorry, wave second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, Freddie, Hardy. Wave. Thank you. And now I'd move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson. Pass. Thank you. And then I'll move to the uh, the variance that goes along with this property. And again, anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. Ordinance 1963 to grant a variance from, from the provisions of sections 3363.41 storage of the Columbus City Codes for property located at 835 North Cassidy Avenue to permit re reduced open storage setbacks for an industrial development in the M Manufacturing District. The, the applicant is CCC, the Columbus LLC, Attorney Jeffrey Brown. The proposed use is outdoor storage. The East, the, the C Department's recommendation is approval and the East Columbus Civic Association's recommendation was also approval. If there are no questions or comments, I first move to waive second reading. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, favor, Remy, Tyson, pardon. Wave. Thank you. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Second. 
That's his father. Oh. Brown, Brown, Doran, Faith, Amy, Tyson, Park. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1970-2020 to rezone 3505 West Dublin Grandview Road, being 0.9 acres located on the south side of West Dublin Grandview Road, 180 feet west of Federated Boulevard from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Dave Fox Remodeling, care of Greg Race. The proposed use is to expand a parking lot for a, for a contractor's office. The city department's, the city department's, I'm sorry. Uh, recommendation is approval, and the Northwest Civic Association recommendation was also approval seven to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move to amend uh, to emergency. Please call the roll. Amend it. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hart. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1699-2020 to rezone 5960 West Broad Street, being 41.55 uh, acres located at the northwest corner of West Broad Street and Dottery Road from the R Rule District to PUD 6 Plan Unit Development District and the LAR1 Limited Residential District and to declare an emergency. This was, first I would like to, um, well, first I'll do this. The applicant is Metro Development, care of Jeff, Attorney Jeffrey Brown. Proposed use of single unit and multi-unit residential development. The C Department's recommendation is approval and the Westland Area Commission's recommendation is nine to two. Um, this item was tabled on 727. So first I move to take it from the table. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Spaber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Removed from the table. Thank you. And now I move the table until 10-5 10, 10, of 2020. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Spaber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Table. Thank you. And that concludes the zoning agenda for this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping. I forgot to ask for a motion to dispense reading of the journal. So may I have a motion? Second. Please call the roll. Lawrence, uh, favor, Remy Tyson, present. Thank you. And now may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, favor, Remy Tyson, present. Uh, we are adjourned. Council members, are we good to roll? Back into council. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's give a few minutes for folks to turn their screens back on, our colleagues in the administration, <laughs> to virtually come back into council chambers. We are back in regular meeting number 33. The next committee to come before council is the Neighborhoods Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Dorrance. The floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden. Just uh, one piece of legislation the Neighborhoods Committee tonight that is Ordinance Number 2071 2020 to authorize the Director of the Department of Neighborhoods to enter into grant agreements with the African American uh, Male Wellness Walk, Community for New Directions, Community for Refugee Immigration Services. The Columbus Urban League, Impact Community Action, and Legacy U in, in a total amount of up to $392,000 uh, to add needed capacity to address COVID-19 specific services for boys and young men of color. To authorize the expenditure of the related expenses starting March 1st, 2020, 
in an amount of up to $392,000 in the CARES Act fund and to declare an emergency. In 2014, the White House, under President Barack Obama, launched the My Brother's Keeper initiative uh, to address persistent opportunity gaps faced by boys and young men of color to ensure that all young people can reach their full potential. In responding to a call, in responding to a call of action, the Department of Neighborhoods established the My Brother's Keeper uh, Village to be a hub of all the work throughout the city of Columbus, work that you, President Hardin, have been well, uh, well represented in. Uh, we And we all know that COVID-19 pandemic is causing unforeseen challenges related to virtual learning for young people in our city. Um, the My Brother Keeper partnership with these nonprofit agencies funded as part of this legislation will launch an engaging and interactive online in-person back-to-school campaign called Building Optimism and Opportunities for Successful Transitions, or BOOST. This campaign is intended to serve as a way to provide Central Ohio young men uh, young male students of color with academic support, resources, and nourishment during um, the shift to online learning. This legislation authorized the director of the Department of Neighborhoods to enter into a grant agreement using CARES Act dollars, the African American Male Wellness Walk, Community Actions for New Directions, Community Refugee Immigrant Services, the Columbus Urban League, Impact Community Action, and Legacy U for academic support services during this pandemic. Uh, emergency action is requested to ensure that academic support is provided as the new remote school year has already begun. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? I do not see any hands up. So with that, I move for passage. By voice. By voice. Mimi, did you second? Second. Second. Please call, please call the row. By voice. Ms. Brown. Same. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President? Ordinance passed. Thank you, Council President Harden. Do you mind if I go ahead and move on to rules and reference? Please. Thank you. Uh, tonight in rules and reference, I have ordinance number 1802 2020. Um, at this time, I'm going to re request a table this ordinance until our next regular meeting on Monday, September 21st, uh, 2020, uh, as I'm working with the city attorney's office to re review some of the amended uh, language for this legislation. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to table ordinance 1802 until September 21st, 2020. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Jones, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Table. Thank you, President Harden. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilwoman Faber. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Harden. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance Number 1942-2020 to appropriate funds within the Federal Transportation Grants Fund and within the Transportation Grants Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into contract with complete general construction for the intersection improvements James Road at Livingston Avenue project to authorize an expenditure of up to $2,830,921.03 from the Federal Transportation Grants Fund, the Transportation Grants Fund, and the Street and Highways Bond Fund for the project and to declare an emergency. This contract consists of the reconstruction of the intersection of James Road and Livingston Avenue, Work includes removing the existing span wire signals and replacing them with the mast arm installation, installing eastbound and westbound right turn lanes, and improving to stormwater drainage, lighting, and sidewalks. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. Next, we have ordinance number 1979-2020 to amend the 2019 capital improvement budget to authorize the transfer of cash between projects within the streets and highways improvement non-bond fund and the appropriation of funds to authorize the director of public service to enter into agreements with the Central Ohio Transit Authority relative to the Link Us East-West Corridor project to authorize an expenditure of up to $544,256.14 to pay for the project and to declare an emergency. Link Us is a collaborative initiative co-sponsored by the City of Columbus, 
Central Ohio Transit Authority, and the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. The Link Us Mobility Corridors Initiative is designed to help manage growth and traffic flow, provide new mobility options, expand access to resources, and promote equity and economic vitality along key regional corridors. Today, we are considering legislation for the East-West Corridor. CODA will be leading this corridor initiative in partnership with Morpsey, the City of Columbus, and other jurisdictions along the corridor. This East-West Corridor project will focus on three geographies, West Broad Street, Downtown Columbus, and a study of East Main and East Broad Street. Um, I'd like to ask Randy Warntrager with uh, the Department of Public Service just to provide uh, some additional information about this piece of legislation. Randy? Can folks hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair Faber, uh, Council President, President Hardin, and Council Pro Tom Brown. Uh, the Department of Public Service is very excited about the quarters under planning for Link Us Columbus. From the Northwest Corridor that um, we kicked off earlier this year to the East and West Corridors with more coming and an innovative solution will bring to enhancing mobility options along key corridors. Significant population is coming. The department is eager to play a role, a leadership role in transportation mobility planning to manage it. Doing nothing is not an option. These quarters provide an opportunity for our department, our partners like CODA, Morpsey, the city, and affected communities to develop a shared vision and work towards advancing solutions that will improve mobility options to make high quality, affordable housing, employment, education, and healthcare more accessible to more people. Community input for, from stakeholders and the public is welcome and essential as we move forward in making these corridors uh, a reality. I urge you and all the residents of Columbus to go to www.linkuscolumbus.com and give your input on the survey for the Northwest Corridor and also sign up for information on the East and West Corridors as they advance. Um, when we kicked off the Link Us effort earlier this year, um, at that press conference, Code of President Pinkerton announced plans to launch the East-West Corridor project, building on the foundation of the Northwest Corridor work. And this is all proceeding thanks to the vote tonight. I can take any questions that you might have, but thank you for having us and considering this legislation. Thank you for that additional information. Uh, Council President Pardon, uh, I believe that uh, you would like to make a few remarks. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to uh, Randy Bortrager uh, in the Department of uh, Public Service. Um, I am excited about this piece of legislation. Uh, Link Us is something that uh, if you are excited about transit in our city, you should be excited and, and check out Link Us. If you are excited, and, and, and really be thoughtful about Columbus being the largest city in the country without an advanced transit system. So this is a, a interest point for a lot of folks. If you are interested in um, housing and how we create more affordable housing, uh, you will be interested in Link Us in this process. If you are uh, interested in the conversation around equitable uh, Columbus and us building a community that is for all, then you will be interested in this Link Us uh, initiative. Uh, in short, this is a big, big deal um, for Columbus, for our future. As we think about how we add uh, 500,000 to a million people to our community, uh, we do that by uh, uh, investing in transit, investing in uh, development or long transit, and, and having big conversations um, that include zoning and housing and all those other things that we know make up um, uh, our policies. And, uh, and, and really would encourage folks to be a part of this conversation. It is uh, when we look back on our city, 20 years from now, we talk about the fantastic, amazing transit system that serves all and connects all. Uh, we will, it will have its origin in Link Us. So would encourage everybody to get engaged um, and, and be a part of this process as we move our city forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council President Parton. Are there any additional questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I would move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Um, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Council President, may I move on to criminal justice and judiciary? Please. 
Thank you. Tonight in criminal justice, we have ordinance number 1948-2020 to authorize the city attorney to modify an existing contract for special legal counsel with Crab Brown James LLP for the case of I'm Khan Entertainment et al. Rosser et al. case number 2-2020-CV-00101 pending in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Ohio, of Ohio to authorize the transfer of $110,000 within the general fund to authorize an expenditure of $110,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. I'd like to ask Chief Counsel in the City Attorney's Office, Laura becker Morris, to provide additional details. Laura? Thank you, Council Member Favor. Uh, thank you. This particular ordinance is addressing the need to expand uh, for special counsel services. In this particular case, the Columbus City Attorney's Office has a conflict of interest. We are continuing to represent the city. However, the two officers involved, Officers Rosser and Lancaster, also have an employment action that is pending that's creating the conflict of interest within the City Attorney's Office. Uh, it is anticipated that this money, this expenditure will be necessary as it, it seems at this particular point in time, like this matter will be uh, going on to trial. Thank you. Are there any questions for my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Yes. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees, Council. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Health and Human Services Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Tyson. Councilmember. Thank you, President Harden. Have ordinance number 1782 2020 to authorize the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Health in the amount of $9,000 for the Youth Suicide Prevention Grant Program. It is to authorize the appropriation of $9,000 from the unappropriated balance of the Health Department's grants fund and to declare an emergency. The Ohio Department of Health is offering supplemental funding to current child injury grantees to expand current youth suicide prevention activities to include, include remote delivery due to COVID. Columbus Public Health will contract with a community partner to convert their established school programs that involve suicide prevention and adverse childhood ex experiences, which are ACEs, related pieces into a remote, remote learning format. Research will be conducted on the best practices for providing virtual suicide prevention and or screenings for the fall in the school districts that they serve. Students that are served by the community partner will receive virtual suicide prevention programming and will potentially screen and will be potentially screened. For more information about this program, we can contact Carissa Harvey, the Director of Injury Prevention at Columbus Public Health, 614-645-6138. But um, this is so important because providing these funds to support mental health services for youth is important to me, especially as it relates to my work with the Black girls. COVID-19 has exasperated issues that Black girls experience. There is an increasing need for mental health services. Black girls are taking on more responsibility caring for their siblings and household chores during COVID. In addition, many girls are feeling isolated, having suicide ideations, and would benefit from self-esteem and mentorship programs, as well as peer conversations. Key findings of a recent survey conducted by ROCKS, an organization focused on girls, provided additional insight about girls during COVID. That there is loneliness and isolation are negatively impacting teen girls at alarming rates. The majority of girls found that the upheaval associated with COVID-19 was detrimental to their ability to organize, concentrate, and complete their schoolwork. And COVID has also remarkably amplified the stress levels of teen girls. So that's why this ordinance is so important to make sure that we can make sure that our girls are receiving services and that they're not going to um, anything that we can do to prevent suicides amongst, amongst our young people is important. So if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Passed. 
Thank you. The next ordinance is 1845-2020 to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Health for the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, known as WIC, in the amount of $6,332,488 to authorize the appropriation of $6,332,488 from the unappropriated balance of the Health Department's Grants Fund and to declare an emergency. This uh, grant would be from October 1 of 2020 through September 30th of 2021. And again, this is um, the special supplemental nutrition program for women, infants, and children. This program serves as a safeguard to safeguard the health of low-income pregnant, postpartum, and breastfeeding women, infants, and children up to age five who are nutritionally uh, at nutritional risk by providing numerous numerous nutrition, I'm sorry, nutritious foods, information on healthy eating, including breastfeeding, uh, promotion and support, and referrals to health care and other services. Franklin County WIC currently serves 28,032 clients. And the WIC program is offered at 14 different locations throughout the city. Columbus Public Health, WIC operates nine <laughs> clinics, and Nationwide Children's operates five that are open Monday through Friday, each <clears throat> with each site serving an evening clinic. WIC also service, has services, the majority of their appointments being conducted via phone. Once the appointment is completed, clients are scheduled for a short five-minute appointment at their clinic to load benefits onto their WIC nutrition card. For more information, call Don, contact Don Sweet, 614-645-6755. So this is a very important program for our families. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please call the row. John Brown, Doran's favor. We need Thank you. The next ordinance is 1847-2020. It is to authorize the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Ohio Department of Health in the amount of $258,000 for the Moms and Babies First Black Infant Vitality Program, a culturally specific home visitation program that provides in-home, family-centered service coordination and education services to high-risk, low-income African-American pregnant women and their infants to age one who reside in 14 specific Columbus zip codes and to authorize the appropriation of 258,000 from the unappropriated balance of the health department's grants fund and to declare an emergency. The Moms and Babies First program will serve 129 high risk um, African American pregnant women and their infants up to age one. They will be um, they will also provide services to reduce infant mortality by, by supporting preventive health and prenatal services, uh, initiation of healthy behaviors, and setting family goals. The zip codes will be 43203, 456, 711, 15, 19, 22, 23, 24, 27, 29, and 32. Um, the, uh, the ongoing visits will be either from telehealth or face to face with outreach workers to support parents in learning how to improve their family's health and provide better opportunities for their children. So it's a very, very important program um, to support our, um, our, our moms and their children um, so that they will have better outcomes and, and have a really good start as they, so they can have a better overall quality of life. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Please call the row. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hart. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1874-2020 is to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept additional funds for the uh, from the Ohio Department of Health for COVID-19 contact tracing grant program in the amount of $1,839,752 and to authorize the appropriation of $1,839,752 to the Health Department and the Health Department's grants fund and to declare an emergency. The Ohio Department of Health has distributed over 100 over $12 million in funds to local health departments to be used specifically for contact tracing activities. And, and they are so important right now to make sure any individual that is um, 
could be diagnosed diagnosed with COVID that we're able to trace the individuals that they have been around to again to try to mitigate the spread of um, COVID. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Ms. Carla Brown. Brown Brown Dorrance Remy Tyson President Martin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2069-2020 to authorize the Department of Neighborhoods to enter into grant agreements with the Community Development for All People, Community of Caring Development Foundation, and Afrocentric Personal Development Shop in an amount total up to $600,000 to add needed capacity to address COVID-19 specific services for youth and family empowerment and to add needed academics academic services during COVID for youth and families in the city of Columbus to authorize an expenditure up to $600,000 for these services starting September the 11th of 2020 with the CARES Act Fund and uh, to declare an emergency. With the uh, spread of COVID-19 and its corresponding response, it is necessary for the city of Columbus to provide additional funding focused on our youth and families, specifically in the case of job readiness and educational empowerment. These funds will be invested will be invested in community groups and providing direct assistance at the grassroots level for our youth and families in the city of Columbus. This, the services include this contract cannot be provided by existing city employees because these services are beyond the city's current responsibility and capacity uh, to provide. And we're thankful for these organizations to be able to continue to work with our children and provide resources to them and their families so that they do not fall behind um, based upon this based upon the pandemic. If there are no questions or comments, I um, from my colleagues. Um, I move for passage um, by voice vote. Second. Please call the roll. My voice. Ms. Brown. Brown. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Doran. Yes. Ms. Faber. Yes. Mr. Ramey? Yes. Uh, President Hart. Yes, ordinance pass. Did you call me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it was recorded. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. So, uh, oh, I moved for passage. Oh, we passed. All right, thank you. All right, the next ordinance is 2086-2020. It's um, Greater, Greater Hill, Hilltop Shalom Zone Youth and Community Empowerment Grant Program. It's to authorize the Director of Development to execute a grant agreement with the Greater Hilltop Shalom Zone and amount up to $200,000 as part of the Youth and Community Empowerment Grant Program and to authorize an an expenditure up to up to two hundred thousand dollars from the CARES Act fund to authorize the payment of expenses starting March one of twenty twenty and to declare an emergency. Uh, the Youth and Community Power Grant Program program shall again assist Columbus neighborhoods with engaging youth and families in a positive experience experiences and job readiness. And these funds will be distributed to key community partners with a proven. I'm sorry. Um, with proven, I'm sorry, my notes, proven track record and um, and and data back, data backed outcomes. And these funds provided by the city shall be distributed via many grants to grassroots community based organizations um, with the same goal, positive experiences for our youth and families and job readiness. If there are no questions or comments, um, I would, and this is, well, the, I'm, I'm going to step back a minute. As a key community partner, the Greater Hilltop Shalom Zone will distribute grants at a minimum of 10000 and no more than 25000 to organizations predominantly or wholly in their geographic boundary, targeting one of two areas, youth, family engagement, and workforce development. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Council Member Tyson. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, Council President Harden, I apologize. I need to, um, I was having some technical issues. I do have to abstain from the previous ordinance, Ordinance 2069-2020. Okay. So we should go back. Should we pass this one and then go yeah, back? Second, second on this one. Okay. Two second it. 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harvey. Ordinance is passed. And let's go back. So we want to go back and. Um, I make a motion that we reconsider 2069 2020. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Reconsidering Ordinance 2069. Thank you. So again, Ordinance 2069-2020 to authorize the Director of the Department of Neighborhoods to enter into a grant agreements with the Community Development for All People, Community of Caring Development Foundation, and the Afrocentric Personal Development Shop in a total amount of up to $600,000 to add needed capacity to address COVID-19 specific services for youth and family empowerment, and to add needed academic support services during COVID-19 for youth and families in the City of Columbus, and to authorize expenditure of up to $600,000 for these services starting September the 11th of 2020 within the CARES Fund, CARES Act Fund and to declare an emergency. And again, um, the uh, this funding is, is integral to the success of our families and young people um, during COVID. We want our children to be able to continue to move ahead academically as well as provide any other service that are needed for them to do so. If there are no questions or comments, I um, for passing by voice vote. Second. Please call, please call the roll by voice. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Doran? Yes. Ms. Faber? Abstain. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Hart? Yes. Ordinance passes. Thank you. And the last ordinance, if we move back to page 22, it is ordinance number 2070-2020. And it is, and again, as I mentioned earlier, this is Sickle Cell Awareness Month, and that this legislation is to authorize Columbus Public Health to enter into a grant agreement with the James Cancer Hospital and Solar Research Institute in support of efforts to enhance health service telehealth participation for sickle cell disease patients to authorize an expenditure within the health operating fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance authorizes um, Close Public Health to enter into an agreement um, with the James Cancer and Solov Research Institute to support efforts to enhance telehealth participation um, for sickle cell disease patients. As telehealth quickly became a prominent mode of healthcare delivery because of COVID, an informal survey regarding telehealth services was conducted on 20 random sickle cell patients being seen during one week in um, one week in the clinic. Of those 20 individuals, 10 were barrier, 10 barriers were identified amongst the six patients. The Ohio State Comprehensive Sickle Cell provides care for 400 patients with sickle cell disease. And the majority of these patients with established care at the James live in the Columbus area. These Columbus residents with identified barriers to access would be targeted, would be a targeted constituency group. A formalized screening would be developed to allow for systemic identification of barriers needing to be addressed. This program would allow for development of a, a menu of options such as cell phone plans, internet hotspots, cards for prepaid cell phone minutes, and cell phone enhancements to accommodate physical disabilities hearing or virtual impairments with the goal of breaking down barriers to telehealth to utilization of telehealth measurements of success will include increased telehealth participation amongst participants especially as COVID-19 remains a threat to public health decreased no-show and appointment cancellation rates and improved health outcomes related to the rapid access to health care providers um, so if there are no other questions, no questions or comments, um, I would certainly um, love my, appreciate my colleagues supporting um, these um, <coughs> options to be able to, especially telehealth options, to be able to provide services to individuals with sickle cell disease. And I, um, so I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. 
Brown, Brown, Doris, Faber, Remy, Tyson, Taylor, and Carter. Pass. Thank you. That's all I have in my committee this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. May I have a motion to adjourn meeting number 33? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran, Faber, Tyson, President Harden. Meeting number 33 is adjourned. We have three non-agenda speakers, a couple on um, WebEx and one in person.